expects updated forecasts from budget 2024 and is primarily attributable to two items, an increase of $1.9 billion in public debt costs, primarily due to higher projected interest rates and higher borrowing requirements, and a decrease of $533 million in elderly benefits due to revisions to the projected number of beneficiaries. I'll now continue in French. <laughs> Almost two-thirds of the spending proposed in these supplementary estimates, that is $7.8 billion, falls under the Indigenous portfolio and is mainly aimed at settlements and claims by Indigenous peoples. Planned spending on professional and special services accounts to $704,000 million, bringing the total proposed authority for 2024-2025 to $19.8 billion for this expenditure item. Approximately $1.6 billion, or 12.5%, is spent on 11 measures in the 2024 budget, so $605 million for the Zero Emission Vehicle Incentive Program, to help parliamentarians in their review of the implementation of the 2024 budget, we have prepared tables that list all budget initiatives, the amount of planned spending, and the corresponding legislative funding authorities. These tables, which can be consulted on our website, will be updated throughout the year as the government presents its legislative program. Jill, Chris, and myself will be pleased to answer any questions you might have about our analysis of the supplementary estimates A 2024-2025. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Drew. We'll start with uh, Mrs. Cousy for six minutes, please. Uh, yes, um, Mr. Uh, PBO, always wonderful to see you here, very much appreciated. Um, and we're surprised at your appearance here today, uh, considering the way you've been gagged. Um, as you can see, we've brought in the best from my caucus here in an effort uh, to question your, you, excuse me, our House Leader, uh, Mr. Shear, as well as our finance uh, critic, Mr. Jazraj Halan, as well as uh, Mr. Lawrence. Um, uh, so uh, with that, Mr. McCauley, I'll pass the time over to Mr. Lawrence. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and thank you, Mr. Giroux, for coming, and uh, thank you for your uh, brief statement. Uh, we appreciate that. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, about debt and the, the continued spending uh, of this government. Of course, um, this, uh, this finance minister and deputy leader two years ago promised that the debt-to-GDP ratio would never go up. Um, they appeared to have shoeboxed or shoehorned in uh, keeping the debt-to-GDP ratio in their projections, uh, but there's a number of projections that I think are a little bit optimistic, uh, including getting an additional $7 billion from the increase in the capital gains, uh, ex uh, the capital gains uh, uh, increase there. I was just wondering if I could get your comments on that, Mr. Drew. Well, it's something that we have not estimated independently yet. I mean, the revenue-raising capacity of the increase in the inclusion rate of the capital gains. Um, however, it's quite possible that the revenue raised in the first year of the measure will indeed reach that $6.9 billion, um, especially considering that the measure was announced two months in advance. So it leaves time for some types of transactions to be materialized before the higher inclusion rate uh, kicks in. Uh, it's not the case for real estate transactions, of course, but for stocks, for example, it's quite possible that the number of transactions spikes in anticipation of that increase. What that means is that the revenue of the outer years, so year two and forward, and that's less likely, or it's not certain that it will be uh, at that level, given the number of transactions that are likely to have been advanced uh, in time. So if, if I hear you correctly, Mr. Drew, what you're saying is that if, in fact, uh, the transactions go through or are particularly robust in this year, to the, or in other words, the fire sale, that the latter years, uh, the next two or three years, we could actually see revenue uh, less than expected. Is that, is that what you're saying? Or? It's, it's quite possible, and that's why the profile, as uh, laid out in the budget, has that bump in the first year, followed by significantly less revenues in the outer years, in anticipation of a, a, a higher number of transactions between budget day and June 25th, when the higher inclusion rate kicks in. The other thing I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the capital gains, the revenue expected. Uh, um, the former... Uh, 
if former Liberal finance ministers have actually contemplated that when they brought to down the capital gains exemption from 75 to 50, Mr. Manley, um, that they actually saw an increase in revenue. And isn't it possible that even though the rate goes up, the revenue may stay flat or even decline because of the dynamics of the economy? It's possible, and we refer to that phenomenon as elasticities of tax measures. So if in anticipation of lower taxes, um, there could be decisions, investment decisions that are changed uh, and more investment flowing into Canada, depending on, on the exact profile of these investors. But it's not a phenomenon that is very well understood or easily predictable given the um, volatile nature of capital gains tax revenues. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and uh, just a little bit further on that as well. The uh, a number of uh, venture capitalists and other investment organizations have even gone so far as to call the capital gains tax a tax on innovation uh, and a tax on investment. Um, it, could you see, uh, and I know it's the, the scope of it might be difficult to predict, but is it, is it reasonable to think that it might have a dampening impact on investment in Canada by increasing the inclusion rate of capital gains exemption? It's quite possible. Uh, however, there are a, f a few things happening at the same time. There's the lifetime capital gains exemption on small businesses that is being increased. There's also a new incentive for entrepreneurs in certain sectors that is being introduced at the same time as the inclusion rate is going up. So there are many things at play. So it's quite possible that the innovation aspect will not be affected for smaller businesses, okay. but also um, negatively affected for most, if not all, of the other sectors, those that trigger um, capital gains inclusion or capital gains higher than the thresholds. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Sousa, go ahead, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Giroux, for being here today. Um, it, I noticed that uh, some of my colleagues have questioned you about having a gag order, and that's how you're introduced by the opposition. And as you know, um, you're an independent member of the House. You you are there as a trusted independent officer to uh, direct all of us and provide uh, information where necessary. And Mr. Giroux, are you being gagged by the government of Canada? This is a question that was asked of me in another committee, and I answered in my second language. And then this led to probably... Um, a misunderstanding. So the government is not uh, muzzling me. I was referring to some data that was provided to my office and that the government or the Department of Environment and Climate Change had uh, explicitly uh, said that I could not disclose. But the government has not muzzled me in the publication of a report or in the content of any of the reports that I've published. Um, so like the Auditor General, William Bunsman, or for that matter, even the Governor of the Bank of Canada that operates without political interference, and that's the way it should be. Is that not true? Like, when you mention that you have a report, why is it that, uh, what exactly are you getting at? What's so secret about this report? Uh, which report are you referring to, sir? One well, in particular? You referred, to, you referred to a report that uh, you referenced in regards to the outcomes. I'm not sure what you're getting at. Okay, donc ce que j'ai ce que j'ai dit c'est So what I said is that the government has not muzzled me in the content or in the publication of any of my reports. And so what I said is that the government did provide some data to my office that was useful in the uh, writing up of a report or that will be in the future and I was told not to disclose the data used for the report. What I was saying is that the government did not stop me from publishing a report, did not either suggest that I not publish a report, and I was not dictated any conclusion of any of my reports. <clears throat> so you're not being gagged, you're not being restricted, you have the f privileges as a primary public officer to do what is necessary in regards to what's, what's taken place. So I just want to reinforce that, if I may. And, um, and in respect to the benefit to Ontarians or Canadians, I should say, especially those that qualify for the rebate, you've stated in the past that eight out of 10 are better off. Is that correct? Um, that's still to the 
best of my knowledge, it is still true that the majority of individuals and or households, rather, in Ontario will be better off, including when we include the cost of the carbon rebate and the cost the, what they receive in terms of carbon rebate and minus the carbon uh, the fuel charge that they pay directly or indirectly yes thank you mr chair do i still have time hey you've got uh, two and a half minutes perfect mr Giroux, in regards to the capital gains tax effectively a uh, husband and wife may own some assets, secondary properties, stocks, and they get up to a half a million dollars in gains, of which 50% is tax-free. At that marginal tax rate, what would that be for that individual or those two individuals? Well, one would have to look at the, their province of residence, uh, but if they have a capital gains of that magnitude, uh, it depends if they have other income, for ex example, investment Let's income. Let's assume they make a half a million dollars, 250000 each on that capital gain. What would their effective tax rate be well, on average? Well, if you're asking the uh, marginal tax rate on somebody who is higher income uh, at the federal and provincial level, it would be 53%, but on capital gains, it would be... 66% of that if they already benefited from the 250000 exemption each. Now, you missed my point. They're making only, uh, the husband and wife are making a half a million. They're each making $250,000. It's not 66%. Is it not 50% taxable well, at it, that rate? It would, be, it would be half of 53% if their only income is, um, is, right. is capital gains. It depends on each person's situation. Absolutely, but on average, I suppose a marginal tax rate of around 25%, correct? Yeah, yeah. roughly and speaking, And now, yes. anything above the half a million dollars per family, their effective marginal tax rate would be, what, around 32% now? Anything above that? Is yeah. that correct? Roughly speaking, on capital gains, that is. Right. And what is it in the United States? What are they proposing to do? Do you know? Uh, I don't know off the top of my head, no. I'm not super familiar with the intricacies of the U.S. tax system. So we're being advised that they may be raising their marginal tax rate up to 44% on capital gains, which is well above what Canada is proposing here and still allowing us to be competitive. But we do know that there's some uh, a lifetime exemption, as you mentioned earlier, about 1.25 million and about 6 million or so for other institutions and, and innovations. Um, so what is, in essence, uh, uh, what was, in essence, the 75% inclusion rate? What under, when was that lowered, do you recall? Uh, I think it was in the late 1990s or early 2000s, but I don't have the, the schedule in front of me. Right. That's, I think the conservative so. government had it added 75% inclusion rate, and there was liberals that reduced it to 50%. That's, under, our, sorry, um, that's our time, Mr. Souza. <clears throat> Thanks very you. much. Mr. Savard Tremblay, welcome back. The floor is yours for six minutes. Bonjour, Miss. Hello, and thank you for welcoming me in this committee. I hope that I will be uh, as competent as my colleague that I'm replacing. Mr. Giroux, there's a case uh, that made the headlines in La Presse even last Saturday, and it seems to me to be a case uh, that uh, deals with a, a lack of uh, auditing as to where money is being sent. Isabel Haché published uh, an article, and it explains that it can seem to be a good news uh, story. 40% of uh, indigenous businesses in the registry have increased value in 2022, over 600 million, but that there's been no audit on the true nature, the true indigenous nature of uh, the people who are working. Um, or being awarded contracts since the begin of the procurement uh, process, or we already had a report, uh, a warning against a lack of uh, audit in this work being done. Arrive can we saw that there is different type of strategy so that small businesses can obtain contracts uh, that should have been for indigenous uh, entrepreneurs and uh, over. 50 institutions have raised their hand and said, "Hey, this strategy." Is encouraging, um, is encouraging the use of third party, um, so uh, businesses. So um, 
I am not going to disguise myself, such as one who is in Saturday's article. He doesn't have the status. I do. I have my status card. Each time I have to deal with the department, and it has to do uh, with my indigenous status, I have to prove it. I had to. I have to demonstrate that clearly. So how is it that a bureaucratic um, huge institution is all of a sudden uh, is uh, closing its eyes and is not checking the status. Well, this is something that we did not consider. We don't do any exposed um, audits such as the Auditor General does. This would probably be a question to ask to the Auditor General uh, better than myself. But what we oftentimes see with federal programs such as uh, for our fiscal program, this is rests on honor and the um, goodwill of people with uh, reviews, sometimes uh, targeted, sometimes uh, um, not, random. And um, we can suppose here that um, the audits uh, are infrequent and rare in order to attest to the eligibility of people to this program. Yes, I understand. But when we say, and I understand that this is not uh, your job to do the audit uh, post um, exposed, as you're saying, after the sums have been spent. But since the beginning, there were, uh, well, what happens uh, in the beginning is your bailiwick. So have we uh, seen any changes or any guidelines from Ottawa? I know that you your task is after the fact, but when we talk about 50 financial institutions that are indigenous that raise their hands, and have we seen any changes afterwards? Well. We have not been made aware of any changes as to the administration or the management of these programs or these uh, procurement programs. Do I have any time left? Oh, I still have time. Okay. We're just in the middle. Great. So I'm not going to stop there. So are there any other similar cases where in many other programs, in any other scandals that might happen because uh, we'll see how far this goes. Uh, we'll see if the Auditor General is going to um, appear uh, in this process and we'll have to uh, do uh, further audits. But for yourself, um, in the beginning of a process, early on, are there uh, any guidelines or any warnings? This I'm very surprised that we can talk about uh, an indigenous support program without making sure that these uh, are being awarded to indigenous people. Otherwise, it's symbolic. It's as if you're having, you're making some sort of a speech about unceded lands, and then you don't change anything uh, uh, where uh, indigenous people are victims. In such a country as Canada, it's very typical in this regime. So. Are there any other programs or any other uh, places where you feel that there's a lack of uh, verification ahead of time? Well, I'm not going to talk about specific management of programs, but I will make a general comment. For example, using external and specialized services. The government has committed to reducing the use of outside contractors. But what we see in the supplementary budget, there are authorizations that are in very close to the same level as last year, and and we are only at supplementary A, so we might have supplementary B and C. So it is possible that we will have uh, expenditure authorities that will be very sim similar for uh, as last year for external consultants, and the government did commit to reduce uh, its use of external consultants. It's possible that the amounts spent might be lower, but up until now, there is no indication to this effect that the government will significantly reduce the use of external consultants. This is an example. Do I have time? 25 seconds. There was another article in La Presse uh, that I read last week, and not only did I read it, but I participated. I gave an interview. And so in, uh, we're talking about uh, uh, cost expenditures at GCRA. No, this is not a specific uh, question that we've studied. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Green, welcome back. The floor is yours for six minutes, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. It's a pleasure to be back with so many members that I had the privilege of serving with in the last session here at the Yogo Committee. And it's always a pleasure to have the opportunity to uh, be able to explore the work that you do, sir, as a parliamentary budget officer. Following up on the very, I think, legitimate uh, questions of my friend from the block, Budget 2024 made significant cuts to Indigenous services, including sunsetting for Jordan's principal, 
last time when you were at committee, MP Backrack asked you what impact these cuts would have to Indigenous services. And you said that it was too early to tell, but taking the information from the ISC and the Crown Indigenous Relations, you said, and I quote, there is no reason to believe that information. It seems like there won't be a meaningful impact on Indigenous services. However, since we've now had multiple organizations that were supposed to be supported by Jordan's principle and are now going without funding, they're owed hundreds of thousands of dollars and staff are going without pay. So on reflection of that, what impact will the cuts in budget 2024 have uh, on the ability on these programs to get the funding they are owed and that they need to continue to deliver these valuable services? Um, thank you for the question. Unfortunately, we still don't have data on that. We're, we're waiting for some data from the Department of Indigenous Services. Is this a process in which the organizations could submit data directly, or is it, are you only relying on uh, information from ISC? My information gathering powers extend only to federal institutions. Okay, so perhaps for a future consideration of this committee, we can ask those community organizations to submit in writing that we may then be able to pass forward on to you. Um, I do appreciate that, but I do want you to note that these community organizations are very clear that there is meaningful impact, not just uh, on the short term, but on the long term horizons for their operating expenses. In November, you did an analysis of the community disability benefit in which you estimated that it would take an average annual benefit of $14,555 to lift 1,371,000 people with disabilities out of poverty. Yet, when the government announced its actual Canadian uh, disability benefit, it is only $2,400 per year. That's less than half of even your lowest estimation of $7,683 of annual benefit that would have lifted roughly 276,000 people out of poverty. So this decision by the government has not gone over well, obviously, with people who are legislated to live in poverty with disabilities, their advocacy groups. How many people with disabilities are likely to be, quote unquote, as the Liberals say, lifted out of poverty by the meager $200 a month benefit? So I don't have the numbers off the top of my head about that report that we did in November, but I remember when we did that report, we wanted to give readers and parliamentarians a, a range of potential uh, benefit levels that the government could introduce in response to that commitment to introduce a Canada disability benefit. And I remember that at the time, uh, my office and I was criticized for having the low end of that range as unrealistically low. And uh, it's unfortunate I don't remember the, the date or the data, sorry. Uh, otherwise, I would give you uh, an estimate of that low end of the range that was in our report. And with the government subsidy being, or the government benefit being a bit lower, um, that would be fewer, even fewer people lifted out of poverty. Thank you. And last week, your office released a report focused on the expansion of Simple File by phone. Mm -hmm and the implementation of an automatic tax filing system. I can share with you that in our office, helping people file their taxes unlocks sometimes thousands, if not in some instances, literally tens of thousands of dollars in benefits that they otherwise wouldn't have received. I think about GIS, you know, the way that CPP works, the Trillium and, and uh, OAS, for instance. So can you please take a few moments and discuss the report and the significant impact automatic tax filing will have to Canadians? Yeah, it's, it's something that I've done in the past, personally, helping people who hadn't filed for years, and it unlocked thousands of dollars in benefit uh, flowing to low-income workers who were afraid of filing by fear of owing money, and it, when in fact they were receiving benefits. Uh, so that's why it was an interesting report to do for my office, and we estimate that by expanding the auto file my return, by phone or electronically, there would be potentially $1.8 $1 billion of benefits flowing to people who don't get benefits, who are fully entitled to these benefits, but don't file due to the complexity of the tax system, or they're just afraid of touching whatever relates to taxes by fear of owing money as opposed to not knowing that they would re receive benefits. I can recall as a city councillor the number roughly of $30 million a year that went unclaimed 
and rightful entitlements just in the city of Hamilton across all levels of government. And yet, as you've noted, in a simplified system, particularly I think about seniors, people with fixed incomes, the way in which our system uh, creates artificial barriers for them to be able to get what's rightfully theirs. In your reporting and in your study, did you consider what the impacts of them not having these benefits? And so I think about chronic house, housing issues, I think about health care, I think about the constant refrain we talk about with food banks. What was the cost of them not getting this? Or put in another way, like how, how would this make a meaningful difference for them? So I'm, we, sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt, but didn't leave time for an answer, but perhaps we'll come your back next to round. It. You can uh, we're going to start our second round. Uh, before we do, I understand we might have bells in a half hour at that time. If it does, so I'll ask you see so we can continue up into the vote time. Uh, Mr. Sure, go ahead for five minutes, please. Thanks very much. I thought just to uh, correct the record from the misinformation that uh, the Liberal MP started off his round with, I would just read for the record the letter that you received from Environment Canada on May 14th that said uh, the data the department is providing contains unpublished information. As such, I request you to ensure that this information is used for your office's internal purposes only and is not published or further <laughs> distributed. Liberals also had many, many days where they could have published it themselves. And it was only until the opposition put a production order on notice in the House of Commons that they ended up publishing it themselves. So. Uh, First question I have, is this normal? Do you often receive requests from government departments not to release or publish information that they provide to you? It, it happens, especially when it's confidential data related to uh, third-party information, for example, commercially sensitive data or national security issues. Uh, so it happens when we dealt with the EV <coughs> subsidies, subsidies for battery, uh, battery plant, uh, plant, plants for batteries for electric vehicles uh, or national defense issues but when it is purely an internal analysis and internal data that's not that frequent it's not that frequent okay so the, the liberals have kind of ranked this right up there with national security uh keeping the costs hidden uh, from canadians on, on the cost of the, the carbon tax have you had a chance to look at what the environment department has published on, on the website Chris? Um, uh, thank you for the question uh Yes, we've, um, uh, we've reviewed the uh, files that were provided, um, I believe it was on uh, June 13th, um, and they, um, uh, they are the same files. Uh, there are some additional files that were unrelated that were also provided, but uh, uh, they were the, um, uh, the files we received on back in uh, May. Okay, so, so they have put everything on that, that, that you saw originally when this letter was written to you? Yes, that, that, that is correct. Okay, so just wanted to talk a little bit. First of all, I believe the number, the total hit to the economy, thanks to the carbon tax, is $25 billion uh, by, is it 2030? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. um, but that's not adjusted for inflation, is it? Go ahead. Uh, yes, that is the, uh, the impact on uh, real GDP. So it's been adjusted uh, for inflation. Okay, so that 25 would include the inflation. Okay. Um, can you can you talk a little bit about what that would mean per household? Like, have you like twenty five billion dollars on the global economy? What on a per household basis? What does that work out to? We haven't uh, prepared uh, estimates uh, related to the uh, the per household uh, impact. Um, for us, the um, uh, the GDP data that was uh, provided was was useful to compare to our previous results, but also. Um, uh, more important and used in the, our actual analysis uh, is the impact on, uh, let's say, investment income and uh, labor income in the economy. So these would both these would be the the channels through which households uh, would be impacted, um, and those uh, those impacts are are uh, somewhat larger than the G uh, GDP impact. But uh, our our uh, our plan was to. Uh, as part of our updated analysis of uh, the distributional uh, impact of carbon pricing, uh, we wanted to um, uh, incorporate uh, the, um, the results that uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada provided us to provide a uh, sort of a, a second set of uh, results if, if outside, if parliamentarians and outside uh, organizations had concerns with our model, we could we use their model, sorry. 
So sorry, I, I only just got told I only have about a, about a minute left. So just very quickly, does do you still stand by your conclusion that the majority of Canadians are worse off with the carbon tax when you factor in all those economic costs, lost wages, lost investment opportunities, those types of impacts? When, as a result of the fuel charge and the carbon pricing regime at large. So it's including the output-based pricing system. Okay. Well, one more quick question. Sometimes the Liberals criticize your reports because they say you haven't factored in the cost of climate change. But my understanding is that that is because with or without the carbon tax, Canada will experience consequences from climate change. Is that correct? In, a, in other words, that the carbon tax doesn't magically wave away the impacts that can that doesn't create a bubble around uh, Canada at, at all. So can you just confirm that under both scenarios, with or without a carbon tax, the cost of climate change would still be felt by Canadians? I'm not a climate scientist, but based on the uh, scientific consensus, it needs concerted global action for climate change to stop getting worse. So Canada acting alone is not sufficient. So yes, that's a... as as much of a confirmation as so, they can give. So even with the carbon tax, Canadians will continue to pay, pay the cost of climate change? Unless everybody else reduces their emissions significantly. Okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Baines, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and uh, thank you, sir, for coming uh, once again uh, to the committee. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the spending review um, and the refocused uh, spending initiative. Uh, I think you, you did talk about the uh, the services, the professional services, um, and and you you talked a little. You described that there's still some in 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 the upcoming budget. You still saw that there are still services that are going to be procured or 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 materialize, and that may not or may or may not change what the outcome is. Can you maybe talk a little bit uh, about that? Just clarify that, and then I have a follow-up question. Yeah, I was referring to uh, consulting uh, services, so um, consulting external services and special services, and uh, to the, uh, referring to the fact that in these supplementary estimates A, when combined with the main estimates, uh, so far this year, we at at authorities of $19.8 billion, which will be close, uh, assuming there's nothing else, will be close to the more than $21 billion of the previous year. And so assuming that, but there is likely to be also supplementary estimates B and C, which may add further to the consulting services, which would bring the total authorities for the current year, close or close or even maybe higher than previous years. But these are authorities. It doesn't mean all of it will be spent. So we could be in a situation where total spent is close to or lower than previous years. But it, it's hard to say at this point. The signs are that it'll be very close to. Okay, so years. do you know what the change in total plan spending is uh uh, on professional and special services now compared to uh, this point last year? Joe? I don't have that number um, in front of us, so we could get back to you with that. My understanding is it's uh, approximately $546 million lower now uh, than at this same point in 2023, 2024. Maybe if you could uh, get that to us if you don't have it on you now. Um, can you maybe sir, uh, touch on the standard analysis process that uh, you and your office undertake when developing these reports? Uh, share the process for information collection, situational understanding that is taken by you and your office. So when we produce a report, uh, we gather information uh, usually from government departments and agencies. So when we are when we receive a request, for example, we try to clarify the request as much as possible. If it's not already clear, uh, we determine, based on internal discussions and the questions that are submitted to us, the type of information we will need. And then we proceed to discuss with government departments and institutions if they have that information and what form it's in before sending the information requests so that we can send an appropriately worded information request to the department. 
then I proceed with sending a letter to the minister with a copy to the deputy minister or deputy head. And we usually give them a few weeks to respond. Once we get that information, we analyze it to ensure that it is usable. And from now, from there on, we proceed with the, the analysis and the drafting of the report. And, and that changes, that process changes depending on the tasks that are uh, undertaken. Like how, how much do you need to uh, say pivot or how agile is the team to adapt to the direction of developing uh, these reports? It's, it's a very small team, uh, 30 analysts and, and supervisors, so it, it has to be able to pivot quickly and it is very agile. So the decision-making process is relatively flat and streamlined given the small number of individuals. But by proper discussion with the requesters and with the departments or federal institutions that provide us with the data, we usually um, get what we need to get. Uh, with the a clear understanding of what is available before sending the information request. Ten seconds. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Mr. Savard Tremblay for two and a half minutes, please. Oui, merci. Thank you. I'm going to continue once again on the indigenous uh, issue. We note when we see at page nine of the report, we can see that there's a decrease in 2024, 2025. Could you explain uh, the reduction in funding? I think that it's due to the resolution of some uh, demands that were made or some uh, agreements that were made, agreements that were made for indigenous uh, children that were placed uh, in families and they did not receive the service that they, they had a right to. So there was increase in order to uh, um, resolve these claims, uh, to settle these, and these are not recurrent expenses. So it's the bump of the, of the year prior that's out of the ordinary, and now it stabilizes, and so it's going to resemble this, probably unless there are other changes in the portfolio. For example, new government initiatives or even then um, the expiry of some programs. So we have no certainty as to what's going to happen in the future, but it's likely that the funding level will uh, stabilize or uh, have a modest increase. So what we're seeing here, we, it goes down, it's not to the same level as the a year prior. But what we see here at page 10, they're talking about uh, accelerated resolution. They're talking about claims with regards to federal um, residential schools. Yes, there's always a certain level of claims uh, and of uh, court cases. With regard to the millions for the settlement of claims, could, uh, historical claims, yes, this is a bit nebulous, not because, well, it is very complex, but also because there are, there's a lot of confidentiality around this file or this budgetary envelope for obvious reasons. The government doesn't want to reveal the amount that is being allocated to each uh, uh, claim to weaken its negotiating position. So we have an overall amount uh, for claims and also f uh, for um, the court challenges, but we don't have the detail uh, for each uh, of, these, um, of these requests or these claims that are being made. The first questions I had the privilege of asking at public accounts when I was newly elected was on the uh, amount on which the government owes in settlement, I can wait. We good? Okay. The amount that the government owes. Would you mind if I had a? Okay. Um, one of the first questions I had the ability to ask was the the amount between which the government owes in settlements versus what they've actually paid out in treaty settlements. Is that a number that you're aware of? I'm not aware of that number because it would require tracking over a number of years, if not decades, on the liabilities on the one hand and the amounts that have been settled. Um, and so I'm not aware of that particular amount. 
Okay, the PBO published a note on its website on April 17th admitting that the economic analysis of the consumer carbon pricing done in 2022 and 2023 erroneously included the impact of the industrial carbon price. How was this mistake made? Not once, but twice. This is a question that has been asked uh, several times, and I think that uh, Chris might be able to bring uh, some clarification to this. What I'd like to say before Chris answers is that we did share our results with several people. We always have... Time is limited. Thank okay. you. Chris? Thank you for uh, the question. So um, the error was made uh, back in late uh, 2021 uh, and uh, the modeling that we use, a uh, computable, computable general equilibrium model, um, essentially uh, combined, because there's, there's one carbon price in, in a carbon pricing system, and that carbon price affects both the fuel charge and the output-based uh, pricing system. So uh, that, that price was uh, set to zero in our counterfactual, uh, but it was uh, hitting both parts of the system. We had thought that it was only that one part, the fuel charge, uh, but it was both parts. So um, that was the error. Uh, but uh, in our April 17th notice, um, we still believe that uh, it's a, it doesn't invalidate our analysis. Okay, it's still I, I would say that at this committee and in Parliament generally, we deal with a lot of counterfactual points. Uh, and so I would ask you, do you think that your office did enough to ensure the public was made aware of the misinformation? Uh, notre responsabilité est d'informer les parlements. Our responsibility is to inform parliamentarians, and we did that by putting a note on our website. And also, we tried. Uh, we've received a lot of questions from parliamentarians, and also questions from some um, ministers' cabinet. So um, we had the impression that many people who were interested in the climate issue had noticed our note on the website. And since the first day of publication, could we have done more? Yes. But did we have the impression that we had done enough, given the nature of the questions? Um, we have the, uh, it seems, erroneous perception that many people were aware of this. Mr. Halan, please, for five. Thanks, Chair. Uh, Mr. Zhu, um, you know, it's been nine years under this government. Canadian workers today um, get about 58 cents of investment for every dollar uh, American uh, workers get. Um, and this is even before the capital gains uh, tax hike takes place. Uh, do you think that this capital gains tax hike will negatively impact uh, what businesses invest in their workers? It's, it's quite possible, given that the inclusion rate will increase for corporations, um, but it, it's also introduced at the same time as the lifetime capital gains exemption is increasing for small business owners, and at the same time that there is a new um, exemption for certain types of entrepreneurs. However, for larger businesses, there is no such exemption. And it's quite possible, knowing that the behavior of businesses is dependent on the overall tax rates they pay, it's quite possible that the amount of investment will be lower, other things being equal. Yeah, and exactly. So, you know, just for you to confirm that, that what that could mean is a higher capital gains tax could mean less investment on workers' paychecks, on investing in equipment, growing the company, or even hiring more workers which we know Canada's in a productivity crisis. Can you confirm that these are some of the knock-on effects of this? Uh, that would be what you would normally expect. As I, Again, as I said, other things being equal, uh, but that may not happen equally in all sectors, especially sectors where there are other tax in incentives. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, the government uh, admits that there's 300,000 300, businesses, most of them small businesses, that would be uh, affected by this capital gains tax hike. Uh, that, that means there's hundreds of thousands of businesses and that's millions of workers. Canada is in a productivity crisis as per the Bank of Canada. They said this is a, a break glass emergency crisis right now. Um, could this also impact the job creators and those businesses making productivity even worse? Um, a number, sorry, a number of groups have mentioned that that it will impede or restrict, not restrict, but it will lower investment that would otherwise take place. 
and de facto also reduce employment. Again, other things being equal. So that would, and in other words, reduce productivity. It's it's not something that is favorable to increasing productivity. That's exactly the, okay. Um, you know, we've seen over the last nine years of this government, um, because of their policies, we've seen four hundred and sixty billion dollars of investment flow to the U.S. or outflow out to the U.S. Uh, we've seen U.S. GDP per person has increased 50 percent, whereas in Canada it's only grown 4.7 percent uh, in the same given uh, time. Uh, do you think investors are less likely to invest in Canadian workers uh, and this capital gains tax hike would or could have a knock-on effect of having U.S. workers getting a higher paycheck due to investment leaving Canada? Well, as a general rule, if you tax something, less. there is less of it. So if you tax investment, other things being equal, again, it's likely and evidence suggests or, or literature suggests that there should be slightly less of it if you tax, tax something. Okay, fair enough. Um, I want to uh, continue on with the, with the um, conversation my, my last colleague had about the car, uh, carbon tax scam. Uh, you had, you know, when the re report was released, it was admitted that about $25 billion is what the hit to the economy would be because of this carbon tax scam. And, and it took conservatives pushing on this for this report to be released by the department. Um, have you done an analysis or is there an estimate on what impact this would put on Canadian, uh, on government revenues at all? In our, uh, our March uh, 2022 and uh, 2023 uh, reports, uh, we provided uh, estimates of the uh, potential budgetary impact uh, um, related to uh, carbon pricing. And uh, essentially... Does that include this $25 billion hit to the economy? Uh, it, it would include our estimate of the impact on real GDP. So our estimate at that time... Um, I don't have the dollar figure, but it was 1.3% uh, in terms of the reduction in real GDP. That's compared to the 0.9% reduction. In and what, is, what does that mean? Does that mean it's because businesses would invest less in, in their own businesses and workers would have less? It's uh, essentially, that reflects uh, uh, the economic impact of the uh, distortionary tax of uh, related or the, the distortion created from carbon pricing. So okay. uh, households having to you know, less. shift. I just, uh, I just have one quick well. last question. I just wanted to confirm one more time that given even this report, given all the information we have today, uh, including whatever uh, error, which I think was corrected by you rightfully, um, uh, Mr. Zhu, that at the end of the day, that a majority of households will be worse off when you factor in the economic and fiscal impacts of the carbon tax scam. That's we know it's true if you factor the carbon, the fuel charge, and the output-based pricing system. We are in the process of updating it, updating our analysis to isolate the impact of the fuel but charge. But that conclusion will not change, in your opinion. Thank you, gentlemen. Mr. Uh, Kuzmirchuk. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Drew. Um, you have the price on pollution, which is what uh, Canadians and, and businesses pay. And then you have the Canada carbon rebate, which is what Canadians get back uh, in, uh, in their bank accounts on a regular basis, four times a year. And uh, my conservative colleague, Mr. Lawrence, once asked you, do Canadians, is there more money coming into Canadians' pockets or leaving their pockets? And you answered, you responded, most families are better off, we estimate, around 80% are better off. Do you still believe that? Um, I still believe that, and the government has also been quoting that number, and I assume it's based on their independent estimate when taking into account the amount of fuel charge paid directly and indirectly minus the rebate provided to them. How many households are better off in your estimation? Uh, I don't have the number by, by but heart. But out of five households, how many are better off? I would say about four. Again, we don't, uh, it's across provinces uh, yeah. and a different income quintiles. You can just tell me how many households are better off out of five. Yeah, uh, about it's it's hard to have a definitive number yep. because it varies across jurisdiction. But roughly speaking, we've been saying eight out of ten or four out of five. But it's okay. in the ballpark. Eight out of ten families are better off. 
with the carbon rebate. Four out of five households are better off. Is that correct? And that's our understanding as well as that of the government. Okay. So under, those, uh, under that analysis, if Mr. Uh, Pierre Polyev uh, eliminates the Canada carbon rebate, how many households will be worse off in my community, let's say, uh, in Windsor, Essex, based on that analysis? Well, it depends what policy action is precisely being let's taken. Let's say the carbon rebate is eliminated, which is what the Conservatives and Mr. Polyev want to do. How many families in my community, based on your analysis, will be worse off? I don't know exactly the profile of people in your community. Uh, so we've sure. done, uh, uh, we've the average, the numbers. medium, uh, median household income is, is seventy thousand, seventy-five thousand dollars in my community. Based on that information, how many would be worse off if the carbon rebate is eliminated? That would depend on the exact profile of sure. people in your community. I'm sure it does, but on average, uh, on average, you could reverse engineering the numbers we have been saying. Okay, and, and what would that be, sir? Ça pourrait être autour de huit. It could be around eight uh, out of ten, but it depends on the specific profile. Would be worse off knowing that four out of five would be are better under the system. How many would be worse off if the system was eliminated? It's, if the rebate was eliminated. C'est une question hypothétique à laquelle ça. It's a hypothetical question and it would be hazardous to answer without having the specific profile of people in your community. I know it's not the answer you want to hear. If families are better off yeah. with the system, with the carbon rebate, if that was eliminated, how many would be worse off? Ça dépend on si on élimine la, la... It depends if you eliminate the fuel uh, charge or the fuel charge and the terrification system uh, for um, large emitters. So it depends. If we think that 8 out of 10 are better off um, on average in terms of a budget, we can do the opposite uh, calculation and see that the uh, opposite will apply. Logically, it could be 8 out of 10, the same thing, but it would depend on the specific profile of people in your writing. Worse off. Ça pourrait être un scénario qui s this scenario could apply in your writing if uh, their consumption profile is the same as that of the average of the rest of the country. Sir, uh, you've been here in front of this committee now about 20 times since I've been on here. I always uh, welcome your testimony and, and your insights. I feel we're always better off when you come here. Uh, you always carry yourself with the highest integrity, uh, with pride, uh, and I know that your reputation is very, very important to you, and your word carries a lot of weight. My conservative colleagues are trying to, to uh, transform the parliamentary budget officer into the political budgetary office. This is dangerous. And I wanted to ask you, you know, they say that you've been gagged. Sir, have you been gagged by this government? I answered this question earlier, and so I can repeat this. Uh, with, it's my pleasure to do that. So what we suggested and what the officials at uh, climate, Environment and Climate Change suggested is to not publish data that was provided because that data was confidential. But in no case has the government or any a representative of the government, have they stopped me from published a report or have they dictated conclusions of a report? So my office uh, was not muzzled in that sense, not at all. So just to confirm, you were not uh, gagged, is that correct? Uh, non, j'ai pas été. No, I was not gagged. And so this is a conclusion that is correct. Thank you. Mr. Lawrence, please. Thank you very much. Uh, and I, I, I must admit, I'm, I'm a little exhausted to say, I would assume you're so even more, Minister Drew, about litigating the, the, the carbon tax. Um, so, like, I'm not here to play games. I'm just going to say, I'm just going to say this like it is. Um, so if you just take the fiscal impact, it's eight out of 10 Canadians are better. And they can quote me and they can put that on there. The, but the reality is, the truth of that is that once you include the economic impact, six out of 10 Canadians are worse off. Is that not correct, Mr. Drew? When we include the economic impact of the fuel charge and the output-based pricing system, it's true that the majority of households are worse off, and we are uh, in the process of updating our analysis to try to isolate the fuel charge, the impact of the fuel charge itself. Yeah, so, so when economic and fiscal impacts uh, are combined, the, as you said, the majority of Canadians are worse off. That's correct. 
Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Schur. Um, and um, I just, and one last thing on the carbon tax, and then I, I promise I'll move forward. Uh, but the, uh, it, the, the, the government's own, knowledge, uh, own report uh, appears to uh, validate your conclusion. Is that correct? That is our understanding because they arrived at an, an estimate of a negative 0.9%, rounded to 1% of GDP when including the fuel charge and the output base pricing system, where we had 1.3% in 2030. So that's in the ballpark, and that's very close for that type of analysis. Yeah, and my apologies. I'm just reminded by my colleague that uh, I need to get you actually on the record, even though I got a nod. Um, so I'm just going to repeat my previous question. The, as you said in page four of your report, uh, when you include both fiscal and economic impacts of the of the carbon tax of the fuel charge, uh, the majority of Canadians are worse off. Our report also included the output based pricing system, yeah. so it's not the, just the fuel yeah. charge; it's the fuel charge and the output based pricing system. And considering the economic impacts and the fiscal impacts of both measures, yes, the majority of households are worse off. Thank you very much for that. How much time do I have left? Perfect. I just want to talk, as uh, my uh, initial uh, round, we talked a little bit about the budget and some of the projections. We talked about the, we talked about the capital gains. The other, another area that I have concern about the projection is with respect to the government's prediction of saving billions of dollars by reducing the size of the civil service. The civil service has grown since uh, 2015 by over 40%, and now they're telling us that they will begin a plan by saving $1.3 billion in next year's budget by reducing the civil service by addition. Do you share any of the concerns? Because when I talk to the department officials, they never have a plan for reducing the size of their footprint. Um, I share these concerns because the budget indicates that they'll be reducing the number of FTEs in the public service by 5,000 over four years by attrition. But the budget also has a number of measures that will reasonably um, are reasonably expected to require more public servants. So it will either mean that there will be more reductions in certain sectors to make room for this increase in some areas while also reducing the aggregate size by 5,000, or there will not be any reduction at all. Yeah, and so we potentially could see greater losses in the civil service uh, uh, and the other, uh, the other negative outcome that... Uh, uh, is perhaps likely um, is the fact that instead of uh, instead of the civil service being reduced in size, they may actually grow. And if that were to happen, if the uh, if the dollars that are forecasted for reduction, uh, that would put the government off of its fiscal anchor of debt to GDP ratio, would it not? It would probably absent reductions in other areas to compensate for that. And I'd add that based on historical results, where departmental plans indicated a reduction. In, in, in ex a reduction to come in their overall number of employees, we have seen instead increases. So that's on good. Uh, that's what I'm basing my my assessment. So either for. the government's going to miss its uh, uh, its fiscal anchors, or the civil service is going to have even more cuts uh, than are predicted. Um, it's either cuts to the public maybe. service or reductions in other areas if the government is to meet its fiscal targets. Thank you very much. I'll get there. Yes, sir. Thank you. And let me start by saying welcome back again. <laughs> I'm glad that yeah, this is a, this is a committee that you feel quite comfortable on a very, very short notice to come, to come even when the uh, situation is with, uh, uh, hot nowadays. Um, so um, we've, we've talked about a number of things here aside from the uh, estimate A, but so I'm going to go on, uh, on that path as well. Uh, thank you for clarifying on on uh, on, on the gag. Um, gag order, you've done that in both official languages, so thank you very much. Um, can you quickly highlight what's the difference between a data file, a raw data file that was transferred to you, uh, as opposed to a report? Uh, so-called secret report by the government. Uh, can, can you distinguish the difference between those two? And if there is there a secret report that the government may have passed to you that you are holding? Thank you, Thank you for the uh, question. Uh, so uh, the the 
information that we requested uh, related to estimates of the economic impact of carbon pricing. And uh, they were, we were referring to uh, a report that the government had published um, entitled How Pollution Pricing Reduces Emissions. And so we wanted the um, corresponding economic data related to those, uh, those emissions. And uh, that information was provided in the form of um, an Excel spreadsheet, uh, very detailed, uh, um, and it, it did fulfill the, um, uh, our request in terms of the, the nature of the data, national, provincial GDP, um, impacts on investment and labor uh, income. So uh, that was provided, but as Mr. Giroux said, um, we were restricted from uh, uh, distributing uh, that or sharing, uh, disclosing uh, that data itself until um, the government published that uh, uh, on, I think it was uh, last week, on June 13th. And, uh, thank you on that. Now, ha has your office, uh, Mr. Joe, done any uh, study on the capital gain uh, policy that's being released? Not yet. We're in the information gathering stage. We sent information requests to the Canada Revenue Agency. Yeah. Uh, we are waiting for that data, um, but um, we are planning on doing that as soon as we get data that we can okay. use. Thank you, because a lot of my colleagues across were, were asking questions as if, and, and you thank you for being comfortable at least sharing your thoughts as a given point with reference to the, the already existing information, what you don't have all the data and you haven't done a report. And you qualify that in your statement. You said, hey, look, I haven't done the report. There is no analysis yet. But if you look at that instance, um, these are the indications. So uh, thank you for also clarifying that there is no capital gain uh, study done yet, but you plan to do it. Now, with about two minutes left, I'd like to actually go back to um, to the estimate A. Uh, plan spending on professional and special services uh, account for about $704 million in proposed spending, bringing the total proposed authorities to about $19.8 billion. What trends do you see on that? Is the government on track, in your opinion, on reducing the um, uh, professional services? Um, it's, it's a bit early to be definitive about that, but uh, based on current year-to-date trend, I would say the authorities suggest that it'll be difficult or it's put still possible to reduce spending on professional and special services, but the authorities to date suggest that departments will have authorities to spend close to or, well, close to or even above what was spent in 22-23. We don't have the final numbers for 23-24 yet, but the authorities are $1.8 billion lower than they were in 23-24, so, and they're still supplementary estimates B and C, yes, so we could be very close to last year's authorities. Yeah. Uh, 30 seconds I got. Um, these supplementary estimates uh, are seeking of $1.6 billion across 11 initiatives, compared to the $7.2 billion across 17 different initiatives last year. Well, what's the difference? Thank you, Chair. Go ahead, quickly. Um, yes, yeah, so for, for the budget measures, um, that's that's the amount that we're at for, for implementation and supplementary estimates A. Um, we don't have much uh, more information to share other than it might just be a bit of a slower pace of implementation. Um, as we've noted before, with a later budget this year, it could have explained um, maybe why we're seeing less coming through supplementary estimates A this year compared to last year. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Sabar Tremblay for two and a half minutes, please. Oui, merci. Alors, premier... Thank you. First question. So we see on page eight uh, on the budget for vehicle registration. We see the percentages. We see, well, we see that the percentage for 2023 was 10.8%. And we know that in 2030, we don't want to have any uh, fuel uh, consuming vehicles, any new uh, gas-powered vehicles. So what's going to happen afterwards? Given that the mandate will be constraining uh, for uh, importers and builders, we uh, think that 
uh, it's through regulation. We expect to reach the targets that are set out by the government to reach uh, zero new um, uh, fuel-consuming vehicles in 2030s. This was on a voluntary basis that we're expecting uh, that we will reach 20% in 2026, I believe, and uh, 40, and then eventually 100%. In terms of expenditures, do we have an idea? The expenditures, well, we uh, haven't done any forecasts uh, for the expenditures with a mandate uh, limiting uh, the manufacturers to importing or offering these uh, vehicles. There might not be uh, a need to have funding or subsidies, so it's going to depend. There might not be a need for subsidies. On page 12, we can see that uh, the PPO has not received a breakdown according to expenses for all organizations. My question might seem naive, but at the same time, it's quite broad. How, uh, how do you work then? We wait for the data to then do the analysis. Well, how are you going to have access to this soon? Are we going to have access to more detail as well? So are you talking about professional and specialized services? Yes. Okay. So we are working on a macro basis. We see what's included in the main, bud main estimates, the supplementary estimates. This gives us uh, the authorities on overall. If we want a further breakdown, we can add it during the year and hope uh, to receive the more detailed data. So very quickly, well, Given that these are questions that uh, are quite lengthy, I'm going to thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Green, for your final intervention. Two and a half, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I actually just have a concluding question, so feel free to take your time in answering it in your best abilities. And I do want to go back to the original analysis on the carbon rebate. When you did your original analysis, you claimed that while most families would receive more from rebates than they paid into carbon pricing, those benefits would be erased once the impact on job growth and incomes was factored in. You did not, however, factor in the impacts of climate change if the tax is not implemented. Why did you choose to analyze the potential impacts on job growth but not the potential impacts on climate change? 